Others give rise to thunderclaps. This is Buddhist Books Podcast, episode 220, Padma Sambhava, part 13, in which I will continue reading aloud The Life and Liberation of Padma Sambhava. It's very shiny, reflects the window in front of me. And I will begin reading with Canto 22. If you would like to start with Canto number one, you can click right there and that will take you to the playlist for the Padma Sambhava recitals. There are 13 so far, including this one. And uh, I hope everybody's doing well. Um, some new things for the people who are only tuning in for the Padma Sambhava recitals. Uh, what's new? I added a, a new book to our reading list every 10 episodes on the fives. This is every 10 episodes on the zeros. So it's 220 is the, the episode. Uh, so 225, 215, like that. Uh, we're reading some Shingon. So if you'd like to check out Japanese Vajrayana, you can click there and, uh, you know, it's interesting. But for the Tibetan Vajrayana, I mean, it's sort of a specific thing within Tibetan Vajrayana, the life and liberation of Padma Sambhava. Um, then, you know, stay tuned to this uh, and we'll, we'll get to that. Now, normally, too often, I've been playing um, a series of albums by Henry Wolfe and Nancy Hennings called Tibetan Bells. And um, today I'm going to mix it up a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I don't know what I'm going to be playing in the background yet, but when it begins playing, the album cover will appear here and the, uh, the, the link as well will appear up here. That's for the people watching on the YouTube. For the people on the podcast, hello, for the people listening to the audio-only podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, or any other podcasting platform, hello. Feel free to tune in to the YouTube channel called Buddhist Books Podcast if you would like to know what the music is that you're going to hear in the background. Otherwise, I hope you enjoy the recital. And without further ado, I will turn on the AC because... You know, it's a bit warm in Goa, India today, and indeed this month. Hopefully it won't cause too much noise pollution. Canto 22. The Sojourn in the Cemetery of Chili Grove. Then, having hastened to the land of Pankala, the prince dismounted from the marvelous horse and sat down in the cavern where the precepts of India are guarded. After the ritual opening of the mandala of the diamond plain, at the end of seven days of adjuration, he attained the perfect state. The host of the gods of serenity, like the iridescent arch of the sky, held up to the elect a supernatural mirror. Seeing his face, he obtained both the mighty and common attainments, and became the knowledge of life receptacle, ex exempt from birth and death. Now directly to the southwest of the diamond throne, there extends for five leagues and more 
the cemetery of Chili Grove, a grove filled with decay, also called the reed bed. Located in an area measuring one and a half leagues around, it is like a land of precious jewels, level like the palm of the hand, lofty and without hollows. In the middle, where it fell from the hands of the gods, is the stupa structure which gives happiness, a stupa on the outside, but within a celestial place, made of all sorts of rare substances. The door is copper leafed with gold, and the palace supports the disc, the parasol, and the chalice. It has bells well arranged, which sound various notes, and has four statues of the master, one for each side. In the northwest of the cemetery is the statue of the great god of the world, and Pasala the tree of desires. Inhabited by innumerable multitude of the birds of the tombs, the god of the world, Nandi Kesvara, rides a black lion, holds a black trident, and wears a flowing robe the color of red poppy and with their following of inescapable executors, numbering 10 million, the spirits of the eight classes are assembled. There are to be seen countless dakinis. Some of them have eyes that dart out sun rays. Others give rise to thunderclaps and ride water buffaloes. Others hold sabers and have eyes which inflict harm. Others wear death's heads, one above the other, and ride tigers. Others wear corpses and ride lions. Others eat entrails and ride Garuda. Others have flaming lances and ride jackals. Others, five-faced, are steeped in a lake of blood. Others, in their numberless hands, carry many generations of living beings. Others carry in their hands their own heads, which they have severed. Others carry in their hands their own hearts, which they have torn out. There are others who have made gaping wounds in their own bodies and who empty out and devour their own intestines and entrails. There are others who hide and yet reveal their male or female sexual organs. Riding horses, bulls, elephants. In the central lake, cloud of purification. In the carnal ground, the haunted place, where others cannot venture. There they stand, sucking the substance of life, thinking of the conversion to be carried out. Padma Gyalpo, having come to this place, took for a seat a heap of both recent and older corpses. Trembling with fear, the living beings who dwelt in the cemetery came forward to offer him fruits of rare beauty. While the Dakinis bowed down to him again and again, now, leaning against the central stupa for five years, by means of the nine excellent vehicles, he taught the law 
to the crowd of Dakinis. It is the custom in this country when a queen or a noble on whom authority has been conferred, conferred has died, when the body has been carried to the cemetery and wrapped in a great cotton shroud, to give all the dead already in the cemetery a bushel of rice for their food. Thus, Padma Gyalpo gave himself over to austerities. Eating the rice, with which the dead had been provisioned, and wearing their cotton shrouds. And when the country was beset by a terrible famine, many died. Though there was no rice for the viaticum to the dead, still those who were brought had the cotton shroud. Padma Gyalpo, transforming such fare, fed on the corpses and wore the shrouds, and brought under his sway the Dakinis and the eight Kairimas. And at Ga'u Sod, he gave himself over to austerities. He killed the demon that rose up. Mamos and Dakinis adored him. He joined with the female demons who rose up and brought them under his power. Now the king of this country, Arti, lost a queen in childbirth. Padma opened her body and brought forth a girl child who was not dead. Quote, for her I will perform the mudras, end quote, said Padma. The king was offended by this and caused all the inhabitants to rise up against him. But the prince, Dharmasri, was clever. He kept armed watch at the end of the valley and made a clean sweep with his arrows. An archer with a keen eye, Shakya sang as Dharmasri let fly his arrows which killed each man they struck, and Padma thus escaped from the arrows of the men in the valley and received the name of Jenny Prince, maybe Genie Prince, who escapes. Meanwhile, the Dakinis gave themselves up to penitences and erected a stupa. Of the history unabridged of the lives of the guru of Udiana, Padmasambhava, this is the 22nd canto. The sojourn in the cemetery of Chili Grove, sealed oaths. <clears throat> now, if I'm not mistaken, this cemetery is near Bodh Gaya in Bihar. And a friend of mine in Greece gave me the exact longitude and latitude where it is said to have been. And uh, so we told, and my wife and I told the taxi driver to go to this place. And I didn't realize, of course, however long this was ago, 1,300 years around then, around that, um, it was a charnel ground. It was a cemetery, and it is now a forest. It's no longer a charnel ground. But there is a charnel ground nearby. And so when we said we want to go to the charnel ground, it's in this area, the taxi driver said, oh, okay, and went to a different place. And we said, no, 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 this place. And I gave him specific directions. And then we stopped on the road, and I walked out into this forest. Here's a picture or perhaps a brief video of that, uh, these very thin trees, and sat and meditated for some time. And I, I picked up a rock, which is right back here beside the statue of Padmasambhava. Okay, moving along. Canto 23. Assiduity in astrology taught by Arjuna, the seer. I don't know what this word is, assiduity. I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly. Just so you know. 
Then Padma went to the country of Benares, where meeting a Sakya, Arjuna the seer, Padma asked him, quote, What knowledge have you? Quote, I have mastered astrology, end quote, was the reply. So Padma offered him pleasing gifts and was taught the calculation. First of all, he learned the manner of succession of the years, the gods having been blessed the feminine the gods having blessed the feminine principle. There arose with the rat ear ignorance. When the six tusked white elephant was incarnated, there arose with the ox ear the formation. When the womb bore little speckled ones, there arose with the tiger year consciousness. When at birth alert ears perked, there arose with the hair year name and form. When as life burgened, burgeoned, a voice sounded from the skies, there arose with the dragon year the six senses. The Nagaraja, having bathed, there arose with the snake ear contact. When a pure golden horse was mounted, there arose with the horse ear sensation. Now the gods, having spread Ew milk. There arose with the ram year desire. When the monkey Hanuman had given honey, there arose with the monkey year attachment. A Garuda, king of winged beasts, having appeared with joined fingers, there arose with the bird year, existence. Kneeling dogs have heard the Buddha Dharma. There arose with the dog year, birth. Nine iron souls, having fiercely struggled, there arose with the pig year, old age and death. The twelve causal links and the procession of the years of the world depend on the twelve actions of the Buddha Muni. Then Padma learned the scriptural calculations of the higher and lower intelligence. Then in bracket parentheses here, it says, there here follows a list of these works and bracket parentheses. I wonder if that's missing for some reason. Uh, but then it says here, I will do my best. And again, I apologize for my pronunciation. Dul Balung Dang Urgya Cher Rol Badang Falchen Sogs Nas Bashad Pa Yi Grangs Ertsis Dang Mado Sidi Brathag Sna Mitshan Ertags Laski Ertsis Fags P H A G S Pa Ertag Ertag Tu Nagu Ye Ergyun Dipyad Ertsis Mado Sede Gesang Ba Chen Po Stan Bebs Ertis Mado Sidi Kams Gesum Snang Bied Gazer Dmigs Ertsis Ya Nagan Das Ba Shi Ba Ros Gros Ertsis Shis Bar Burjad Pa showed dang bag mai ertsis. Duski kor lo i nyi zla 
Gza, Scar Sogs, Bertan Gyo, Fi Nang, Gza Han. Uh, this is almost finished, by the way. <clears throat> Gsum Bert C Chul Dang Erdo Erje Gadan Bzhi E Shri Pa Dren Dzin Ertsis Maka Gro Gya Macho Fi Nang Ernal Bjor Er, the dog barking just makes it all so much better, doesn't it? Uh, Ertsis, Chos, Mungon, Erdul, Dang, Erdul, Fran, Ertsis, Runams, the slabs of the history, unabridged of the lives of the guru of Udiana, Padma Sambhava. This is the 23rd canto. Assiduity in the calculations. Sealed oaths. Okay, doggy. Peace. Calm down. Canto 24, Assiduity in Medicine, taught by the son of Jiva Kakumara. Then, having reached the country of Padmavari, Padma met the son of Jiva Kakumara. This might be, I mean, a reference to, I remember Jiva something Kumar is the name of Lord Buddha's um, physician. Anyway, the doctor. Quote, what is your knowledge? And quote, he asked. Quote, I know the practice of medicine. And quote, answered the doctor. Padma then asked the doctor to teach him the medical arts, to which the practitioner answered, quote, I am old. My body trembles. There is nothing learned about me. I am not a professor. If I were, I would teach you. Even so, because you ask me from the depth of your heart, I will teach you what I know of medicine. There are three summer months, three autumn months, three in winter, and three in spring. This is the order of the months, and there are six intervals. And with the year go the twelve months. Every three months, seasons and grounds for illness show themselves. And every two months are the intervals of the trees. With the appropriate nourishment which is assimilated. In the same way, remedies, elements, and time show themselves, and the senses with the elements in the same way. In the course of the year, the seasons change completely, and when these changes affect the senses, whoever has a body falls prey to all sorts of illnesses. To treat them, the four trimesters, or seasonal periods, the six intervals and the six elements must be known to the good practitioner, as well as the order of solid and liquid remedies corresponding to them. The illnesses whose principle is the air break out in summer. When autumn arrives, the bile begins to move, and so in winter is the cause of illness. The complaints, which have the humors as their principle, break out in spring. In summer, fat disappears, acidity and the salty prevail. In autumn, fat and the sweet are quite fresh. In winter, 
There are the sweet, the acid, and fat. In the spring, the hot and the astringent are glowing. As soon as one has eaten, the humors pour out. While one is digesting, the bile pours out. After one has digested, the air exerts its influence. These are the three moving elements. The ills that have air as their essence are cured by invigorants. Purgatives, purgatives, stop the bile. Corresponding to a third cause of illness, the humors in due time are eliminated by means of emetics. One must know the seasons of the influence of the air, of the bile, of the causes of sickness, and of the humor's influence. Depending on the times, the elements, and the bodies, certain antidotes, antidotes and diet are indicated. Now, a master in the utilization of the materia medica Padma acquired, in an efficacious and expert fashion, the eight-branched science, together with the inconceivable numbers of remedies. Of the history unabridged of the lives of the Guru Udiana Padma Sambhava, this is the 24th canto, Ass Assiduity in Medicine, Seal. I find it interesting that in translating from Tibetan, uh, most of it's in English, except for one little phrase is in Latin. Okay, that's interesting. Well, don't know why. Okay, for today, we'll read one more canto. So that 22, 23, 24, we're reading four cantos today. And there are a total of 108. So... Some of them are longer than others. These are all relatively short. Canto 25. Skillful assiduity in the five arts as taught by various masters. Then Padma came to the land of Ragala, where meeting the doctor Kungi Shenyan, friend of all, an old man, white-headed and with a beard as white as a goat's. He said, quote, old man, what is your knowledge? End quote. And the old man answered, quote, in teaching language and composition, I have no rival in the world beneath the sun. End quote. So Padma said, quote, kindly teach me language and composition. He learned five languages, the well-composed Sanskrit language of the gods, the mysterious Apabramsa language of symbols, Prakrit, the, the regular explanatory language, Paisakika, language of the demonic cannibals. It's good to be able to communicate with them, I guess. The words to be translated literally and those to be translated by paraphrase. The didactic translations and those of conjurations. The different meanings of the same word. The different words with the same meaning. And he practiced the different varieties of writing. Ranja, Nagari, round writing. Those of Kashmir, Sindh, Daruka, and others, Brahmi, Karosti, and other writings, the 64 different kinds of writing. And he learned the various languages, not one, but 360. After that, the artisan Vas Visvakarma, having turned 80, the tangential point of a transmigration, 
showed him the elixir which transmutes into gold, the art of the lapidary, of making images, of tailoring, of carpentry, of making liquors, of working in silver, copper, iron, and stone, of weaving, of, of the making of boots and hats, of casting metals, and all the varieties of these techniques. Then he came to a hamlet, and in a place where bamboo and horsetail grew, smoke was rising. A village woman was making varnish for pottery. Quote, will you show me how to do that? End quote, he asked. And the woman artisan replied, quote, when you have perfectly succeeded in making varnish for pottery, what will you do? It has to be applied, first of all, to stone, then to earth, and finally to cast iron and tallow. All that has to be learnt, all that has to be learnt, and other similar things, end quote. Whereupon, his sample work showed that he had great technical competence. Of the history unabridged, of the lives of the guru of Udiana, Padmasambhava. This is the 25th canto. Skillful assiduity in the five arts. Sealed oaths. good to me. Hope everybody is doing well and uh, I look forward to next time and feel free to tune in to uh, our next episode or if you are only tuning in for Padmasambhava. We're um, reading Mahavaga now. That uh, starts with the fourth book of the Tipitaka. These are the pre-sectarian early Buddhist teachings, the writings in the original, the language that's come to be known as Pali. And, uh, all right. Otherwise, in 10 episodes, we'll continue with Canto 26 and perhaps 27, and we'll see. Depends on how long they, the cantos are. And thank you to all of the, uh, you know, composers and musicians who uh, who played in the background today. You can find that information in the description below. And I will go ahead and get to the closing. <clears throat> to the north and to the south, to the east and to the west, to the spirits of light among us and to the spirits below, we send out our reverent love and compassion. May all beings be happy. May all beings be serene. May all beings.